Jedi are evil! Sign this guy up to be a writer for film theory. But seriously, does Anakin have a point here, or is he just blowing smoke? <sighs> blowing smoke, apparently, but not in the way that I anticipated. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that tries to find the dark cloud in every silver lining. Or in this case, the dark side in every light side of the Force. If I'm being honest, I wish the world could be as black and white as the Star Wars universe makes it out to be. Where you can tell the good guys are good guys because they wear all white and the bad guys are bad guys because they're literally dressed all in black. But with the advent of the new trilogy and the new millennium, a lot of emphasis has been placed on the gray that exists between these two extremes because rarely is reality so cut and dry. But in today's episode, I want to do something different. I want to look back at those older movies and show that things have always been this way in the series. That despite George Lucas's not-so-subtle costume choices from the original movies and the blatant good versus evil storylines that all of these films purport to have, the heroes aren't always the heroes the stories frame them out to be. Specifically, I'm calling into question the actions of the Jedi. Now, obviously, I'm not the first person to speculate about this. In fact, We've already heard it straight from the mouth of a Skywalker himself. From my point of view, the Jedi are evil! But maybe Anakin here is onto something. Maybe when you actually look at their own Jedi Order, their customs, and especially the way they train and recruit new Jedi, things don't look so good for the light side. In fact, when you actually hold up the Order of the Jedi to objective scrutiny, I guarantee that you'll start seeing Anakin's way of looking at things. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. Not on that particular issue. I started thinking about this topic after another famous Skywalker commented back in episode 8. Now that they're extinct, the Jedi are romanticized, deified. But if you strip away the myth and look at their deeds, <laughs> the legacy of the Jedi is failure. Hypocrisy, hubris. While this kind of tea spill coming from Luke was considered pretty sacrilegious, both by other characters in the movie as well as the audience watching, Luke here has a point. If you examine the movies with a little bit more scrutiny, his criticisms aren't exactly unfounded. While there are certainly examples of the Jedi doing some pretty unsportsmanlike things to innocent victims throughout all the movies, like manipulating them. These aren't the droids you're looking for. These aren't the droids we're looking for stealing spaceships and crashing them, or just outright lying about their own powers. I think it is time we inform the Senate that our ability to use the Force is diminished. If informed the Senate is, multiply our adversaries' will. The worst thing about the Jedi is their recruitment tactics. And this is foundational for the whole order. The entire Jedi institution is built on years-long training programs that initiate new members. So if there's something wrong at that base level, it's safe to say that the entire Jedi order is built on a rotten core. And oh, how disturbingly rotten it is, my friends. Let's start at the beginning with the recruit that we're all familiar with, Anakin Skywalker. He's nine years old when Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn meet him, and yet Obi-Wan remarks that Anakin Skywalker is too old to be raised as a Jedi. No, he will not be trained. No, he is too old. Meaning that the Jedi typically recruit at ages younger than nine. In fact, as early as three years old, the Jedi identify Force-sensitive children and start training them. Watch out, Mace Windu. Kappa be coming for ya. Well, this might seem a little weird. You might also be thinking to yourself that a lot of child athletes or children entertainers start young too. Child models, gymnasts, martial artists, dancers, all typically start as young as preschool. That said, being a Jedi is far from an after-school program. Program. The Jedi organized these pre-initiates into clans who stay together both night and day, learning, eating, and sleeping together like a good old getaway camp, except it's away from their parents, unlike a permanent basis. Can you imagine a world where a parent willingly ceases all contact with their three-year-old and sends them away to a compound full of adult men who spend all day waggling their lightsabers? I don't think so. Also, unlike karate or tap dancing or any of the other things parents obsessively videotaped back in the 90s, once you're in the Jedi program, you don't get to opt out, ever. The only way a recruit can be dismissed is with the approval of the Jedi Order, which Obi-Wan tells Anakin in Episode 2. 
Be mindful of your thoughts, Anakin. They betray you. You've made a commitment to the Jedi Order, a commitment not easily broken. Until he completes his training, Anakin is in every sense of the word an indentured servant to the Jedi Order, and a literal prisoner of his training, where we know they're forced to do things like blind combat with droids, actually hurt people, as well as initiation tests that canonically see children fighting in simulated life or death scenarios to test their force abilities. From a functional standpoint, the Jedi Order is an irrevocable cult that lands somewhere between an involuntary boot camp and human trafficking. So Anakin, as a 19 year old, has a commitment that can't be broken, one that he isn't allowed to leave because when he was 9 years old, he decided he wanted to be a space wizard. Did he realize what he was giving up? No, of course not. He just saw really cool force powers and laser swords. What child is gonna turn that down? Can a 9 year old really be expected to commit to what basically amounts to an entire childhood of indentured servitude and fully understand the commitment that they're about to make? Hey, little kid, want to join our cult for the rest of your life? You'll get a lollipop and a laser sword. Okay, Mr. Jedi. There's a reason that in our real-world legal system, a nine-year-old isn't allowed to enter a legally binding contract. They're not mentally ready. And remember, most of the Jedi are recruited younger than we see in Anakin Skywalker. And this commitment, along with the complete separation from these kids' parents, it matters a lot. If the Jedi cared at all about the children under their tutelage, they would know that scientifically it can be incredibly damaging to separate young children from their parents. At least according to licensed clinical social worker and child developmental specialist Mary Wallace, quote, studies have shown that if a child suddenly loses a parent, the child experiences intense fear, panic, grief, a combination of sadness and loss, depression, helplessness, and hopelessness. The child has lost his lifeline, and often his sense of self. The world and life becomes disorganized and terrifying, end quote. This is true not only in cases of abandonment or death of a parent, but also true in cases of voluntary separation. This is because children learn to trust the world through their parental figures, who provide a stable base for young developing minds between the ages of 0 and 7. Severing that connection at the age of 3, or even the ripe old age of 9 years old, sets children on a path to be emotionally unstable. Which, go figure, is pretty darn ironic since the Jedi aren't supposed to act on emotions. But I can't imagine how cutting a child's lifeline and psychologically scarring them for existence could possibly backfire. Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? Truly wonderful the mind of a child is. If you really believe that one, Yoda, you'd be more concerned with taking care of those children's mental health, making sure they don't wind up permanently traumatized for life and slaughtering a bunch of younglings. In fact, the Jedi care so little about the relationship between parent and child that in the prequel trilogy, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan literally leave Anakin's mother on Tatooine to continue living in slavery. In episode one, we're told that they take Anakin, but not his mother, because they don't have the money to buy her freedom from Watto. What about Mom, is she free too? I tried to free your mother, Annie, but Watto wouldn't have it. But then a decade goes by without him ever following up. At no point during that 10 year period did anyone bother to think, hey, maybe we should, you know, go check on Anakin's mother to make sure she's alive to see her son become a Jedi. Or, I don't know, maybe go back to buy her freedom since we have the money to do it and we've won the war and her son happens to be the most powerful force user in history. Anakin is only able to return to her a decade later in Attack of the Clones against the wishes of his masters, only to find out that she's been in danger for over a month kidnapped by the sand people. She's been gone a month. There's little hope she's lasted this long. What makes the death of Anakin's mother all the more tragic is that all of it could have been prevented. He reaches her just as she's in her dying breaths. Had he arrived days or even hours earlier, his journey to Tatooine might not have ended with him having to bury her. The only reason that Anakin even knew about her is because he could sense her suffering. She's suffering, Padme. She's in pain. Didn't Yoda once say something about suffering? Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. In this case, it was ignorance that led to suffering and suffering that led to hate. I hate them! And I don't know about you, but it seems to me that if the Jedi had bothered to take even the smallest modicum of effort to keep the family of their Padawan intact, the entire descent of Darth Vader from light side to dark side because of his hate, pain, suffering, all of that could have been pretty easily avoided. The story of Anakin's recruitment also illustrates a larger point about how troubling the recruitment tactics of the Jedi really are. Aside 
Aside from the obvious problems of taking very young kids and signing them up for decades-long obligations that'll be very difficult for them to opt out of in the future, they're even dishonest in the way that they sign these kids up in the first place. Going back to that example of Anakin, when Qui-Gon is deciding whether or not to take him on as a recruit, one of the things that he needs to do is collect a blood sample so they can measure his midichlorian count. Now, in the real world, if you want a blood sample from a child, first of all, you don't get it because it's an incredible invasion of privacy. Like, if you thought Kappa was worried about child privacy, well then you haven't met HIPAA, Kappa's much more powerful cousin in the healthcare world that protects patients from, you know, random cult leaders collecting and analyzing their blood samples. So does Qui-Gon ask his mom for a sample? Does he explain what he's doing to Anakin? Does he even sterilize the needle? Let's watch. What are you doing? Checking your blood for infections. That's it! No permission slip, not even verbal consent. And then on top of all of it, he lies about the purpose of the test in the first place. I need an analysis of this blood sample I'm sending you. I need a midichlorian count. I guess you could try to argue that Anakin is literally living in slavery, and so he and his mother are probably desperate to get out of the situation, and maybe that makes it better, but no! You are so wrong! In fact, the idea that Qui-Gon is preying on people who have no rights and no way to advocate for themselves makes it that much worse. You can even make a case that the Jedi barely think of their recruits as human, as even the venerable old Obi-Wan Kenobi, everyone's favorite Jedi, describes Anakin like this. Why do I sense we've picked up another pathetic life form? That's pretty darn cold there, Mr. Kenobi, old Ben. I mean, I can understand calling Jar Jar Binks a pathetic life form, but Anakin? He's a boy whose incredible pod racing abilities won you the ship parts you needed to get off the desert planet you got yourself stranded on. I'd expect a little bit more gratitude, ya bum. We all I grew up watching these movies thinking that the Jedi were the heroes. The movies outright frame them to be the heroes, but if you actually look at how the Jedi become the Jedi in the first place, their legacy isn't one of freedom and doing the right thing, it's about putting toddlers into slavery, deceiving their parents, and then brainwashing those little kids so they become unquestioning members of their little cult. Sure, we might be a little sad in Episode 8 that there aren't any Jedi left, but believe me, the children of the galaxy should be thanking their lucky stars that the likes of Qui-Gon, Yoda, and Obi-Wan aren't coming up and knocking on their doors, stealing them away from the loving arms of their families. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. All of this, all of this is without even mentioning the lies of the Jedi that happen throughout the entirety of the series. How their actions, their hubris, their hypocrisy, their outright refusal to give up control results in the dark side surging to power and the downfall of the Galactic Republic. Sure, the Jedi are framed as heroes in these stories if we turn off our brains and just look at the wooshy wooshy lady laser swords and cool magical powers. But if you stop and actually analyze the plots of these movies, what is actually happening between these characters and what causes galaxy-wide changes to take place, you start to see that it all boils down to the actions of one group the Jedi. And to ensure that you get that veil ripped off your eyes about all things Jedi related, hit that subscribe button. I know for a fact that 50% of you aren't subscribed but are still watching these theories, so let's change it. Help me get closer to that diamond play button and help yourself by ensuring that you're getting a weekly dose of film theory goodness. Smash that subscribe button, slice it in half with your laser sword, force choke it if you have to, but always remember, especially today since I'm calling a beloved fictional order of space wizards evil, that it's all just a theory, a film theory, and cut.